first two? Yeah, and like, <laughs> I just want, I just want the show about you know segregation. That's the show I want because that was the tense most. And I don't know if that was by design, but the tense most scary sort of stuff was like, you know, the lunch counter scene was more terrifying. You know, the 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 Lovecraft creatures attacking. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's that's pretty close to, was, was... to to my take on the first couple of episodes. Um, uh, five episodes down the way, uh, pick a lane, people. <laughs> like, yeah, this, yeah. I'm, this, this week's episode had <laughs> some weird, had a really great story, but also had to do like this busy work to get this other thing pushed forward, and it, it felt really tacked on. Uh, I agree. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll... yeah. No, go ahead. Andrew. No, no, please, please, please. Um, but like, I thought that the the primary story was like was fascinating, and also had like development for the long the longer story that they're telling. But then, yeah. just this un just this unnecessary meet cute with our main characters, so that they can be in the show this week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. I... Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like a uh, yeah. There really was no reason. <laughs> it was not at all a story about any of our main characters. I mean, except for I, a little. Yeah, a little bit. I yeah, Lovecraft Country. That's what we're talking about. Like I like only see the first two. The cast is fantastic. The cast is just they're great, instantly likable. Great. Mm. Like I said, the the segregationist stuff. <laughs> I don't want to say it's great. I mean, it's extremely extremely well done and you're like that's the terrifying part that's the scary part of like you like you know and I, I get I get I'd like to read the novel now because I get the idea of juxtaposing that with like supernatural elements but that stuff just felt so under delivered it just and then this happened meanwhile <laughs> back in Chicago I'm like I'm like uh I'm still scared back in the friggin the lunch dinette you know about what happened there and this 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 is it does i think it does it's one of those things is a really put you into the point of view to go hey imagine you literally needed a map to know what towns not to go to because people yeah. disappear who look like you and yeah it's uh yeah I, I i i i share the sentiment and i i think that there's like a very interesting this era of HBO programming is very, very interesting in that how much they are like stapling together, you know, between Watchmen and this, like, hey, here's this story that could very much be its own story. Here's this story that could very much be its own story. And now let's move forward with it because I think it's it's exceedingly competent. It's really good. Like you said, like the the cast is is charming. Uh I think that the lore is interesting enough that I am excited to see more of it. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I could kind of, I think my enjoyment of it comparative to compared to Watchmen is how little I care for Lovecraft stories, or at least the, the derivative of Lovecraft stories where we're just going to do the stations of the cross of like creepy cold mystical old thing. Is it good? Is it bad? I wonder what's going to happen. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. My my frustration for Watchmen was just that like they wanted to put elements in there, but without any sort of thing of like, yeah, it just happens that you know in 2020, you know Don Johnson's a racist. It just just like back then, it's like well, there was a lot of different things going into back then, and just that and just that idea. Of, nope, it just pops up. It's just going to happen. Which I kind of know the reason why, because sort of the source material that you know Lindelof said inspired him. I'm like, well, yeah, that's. That's going to be the mindset you're going to come from. Where this, I thought, was like, man, uh, reality can be very scary. Very scary yeah. when you see it from a different point of view. From a different point of view, you go, holy crap. This this nostalgic period, you know, for, yeah. you know, my family, not so much for other people. Yeah. Uh, and also, I think, uh, and uh, I'll be curious your your take, Andrew, going forward, but like, it really seems primarily to be interested in being a horror anthology. Like, well, I, I was I, like, yeah, was yeah. season. I mean, I got start episode. I watched the first couple of minutes of episode three. I'm like, ah, 
African American horror story. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And but, that and that keeps going. Yeah. And in that in that all yeah. of them are different kinds of horror. Like and you and yeah. you get and you're like, oh, this is the this is the this episode, and this is the this episode, yeah. and this is the like, you know, uh the episode that's the reverse of the other movie. And this is uh, you know, the Korean horror one which I guess we're going to get. Yeah. Oh, 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 is that that what they're implying? It's uh, what's funny is I was about to make a joke where it's just like, like what they, they have, they have 20 sided dice uh, with uh, each of the 20 sided anthology horror tropes and 20 marginalized communities. And then they just roll it. And then whatever two come up, it's like, those are the two stories. Yeah. 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 I'm, 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 I'm liking it. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in on it. Uh, I am, I am, far less in on the other show that i watched last night uh the new episode of the vow which i i i now i might be out on the vow really based on the episode last night is is is, is that i i watched it is is that just because um it's losing its way it's like it's it's like like get to the part where they're sex training or no 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 i it it lost me because it felt like it has played a little fast and loose with the contrivance of like uh, exactly where we are in this story, how much of this is present, how much of this is recreated. Oh, uh, that was and, and that was the very first question I had. Well, I was like, I was like, well, yeah, that would be a weird conversation to happen to have recorded. <laughs> and well, the, there's they last 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 night's episode to me went full like. We're, keeping up with the Kardashians. We're putting like, on a I'm play. Like, These are all recreated thing. And like, uh, either you're telling us that like you got cameras there at a moment where they're doing a thing or you're recreating it. And then they seamlessly went between things that were very obviously recreations where they're telling other, somebody else's story with it. Like, and then they just, bump over like oh yeah by the way keith rainier had a uh a, a effectively a wife for 30 years who helped build all this eh, bu- 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 oh. like go go well, right that's by. been like- my my issue my issue with it you know having followed the story for years was when they started off with the point of view of the guy who's we're getting the kind of the guy made documentary i'm like well he's an interesting choice because he had his own controversy with what the bleep do you know and the, the blowback from that when people who worked on that said, you know, children who suffered from childhood leukemia brought it on themselves in this other weird mindset. And then and then I'm looking at the timeline I'm like, no, we knew Rainier had been accused of the, the pedophilia. There had been already all these ex-cult people years before this guy came forward. And I'm like, this is a really weird sequence of events because you would think by watching this that like nobody knew. And it's like, no, some of these people who are are who are, are, you know, we're watching as sort of our protagonists had to be actively involved in suppressing other people and shutting people down and trying to keep, it would be hard. Maybe they weren't, but there was mainstream newspaper coverage about horrific things going on. And there's, and it's, you're just, you're led to believe, oh, all this started in 2017. Like, no, this was way before. What were they saying about this then? And that's, what's frustrating to me because God forbid I ever get involved in a cult. I'm going to make sure I'm really good friends with the documentarians decide to tell that story because <laughs> I'm going to get the Andrew is a hero version of this, not Andrew was a bystander and maybe culpable in some of these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had this conversation on uh, over the phone and it certainly colored how I viewed episode four. And episode four is just like, like good God. It, it is... It, it it shifts into like now there are active heroes, not survivors, are active heroes dismantling this cult. And it's like, oh, like I don't I don't know if I feel comfortable, especially because they don't well like, especially because they're not they're, they're not they're not time stamping any yeah, of it. Correct. So we have no idea whether or not this is it very real much or recreated. Looked, it very much looked like after the fact they went back and we were all like like man let's recreate it of of us deciding to bravely you know do whatever and it's like okay right. well there and there was the scene where they 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 caught on video or she recorded on video when she handed over the vancouver office or whatever to 
the other yeah. people there. Like, just what you know, they're doing this, 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 and this. And I'm like, great. Now we're going to go to the Canadian authorities, right? And we're going to explain, hey, here's the problem. We're going to go to the police and talk about this problem because that would be the ethical thing to do because you're saying they're breaking the law and doing stuff, right? Right? We're going we're gonna to go there. No. So like you just so you just sold them as business is what happened. Like what's kind of murky? Like you just literally you 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 sold them a business and you walked away and like I'm like, ah, I was like, expecting the follow through. And then when we went to the authorities on this, it never happened. Like well, well uh -huh. yeah. also I feel like they're uh at this point in the I have not read any of the articles, so I don't know how how deep everything goes. But I feel like they're holding back, you know, telling the 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 most sensational aspects of 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 you know, like the actual crimes that were being committed for human trafficking and all that stuff. Like, uh, like I guess they 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 really need a good strong third act or something. Maybe I just I, my frustration is that like people go, oh, how do how did, how does this happen? It's like, well, you have two people here who are rewriting their narrative for you. And you could go more into their story and have a better understanding of like, like when did you first hear about the negative stuff at Keith Rainier? Why did you stay? When you, you know, when you transferred the ownership of this facility to other people, why didn't you disclose things to the authorities? Why didn't you? And there's the thing to be said. It's like, how does fraud happen? You know, it starts slowly. You know, you make, you know, you're like, you're short, you know, in your bank account one month and you borrow 50 bucks from the office, whatever thing, and you pay it back and everything's fine. And then, the, then it grows. And the next thing you know, you're committing a felony. And that's that's the thing we sort of often don't understand. We're used to the movie version of somebody, I'm gonna plan a crime, and it's like, ah, it's it's a little soft things there, you know. And next thing you know, you're basically helping run a cult. Right. Yeah. All and right. also, they're not great actors. I think that's what bothered me. It's just I just <laughs> watched too much. I've just watched I've watched people recreate either for our own stuff or in, in other reality stuff. I've watched people try to recreate conversations and you just know what a recreated conversation yep. looks like. It just lacks yep. that spark and everybody's kind of waiting for each other to stop talking. And, and it's just so, like- or, or either that or somebody's response is too on the nose and too well rehearsed, you know? Uh, it's a, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a voice to unscripted and, uh, 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 especially when it's like there are stakes, there are like big stakes that are supposed to be happening, and they're just kind of like, all right, one last gripe. It's just they're like, oh, big things are happening, deadline of uh, time is of the essence. Uh, and this lady's like, I'm gonna do it no matter what, no matter what it takes. For the rest of the episode, she's just literally sipping Pinot Grigio yeah. in this other lady's backyard. <laughs> it's like anything, I, I'll lay my life on the line. This needs to happen. And then every time we go back, it's literally Pinot Grigio in the backyard. <laughs> well, that's the other problem too. It's it's we've had a number of these net or excuse me, uh like H some of the HBO documentaries that were like McMillions, way too long, way too long for like. Ah, so he stole the scratch off things, even to some friends. Ah, uh, no, no, okay, no. Cool. Uh, I don't think you've considered all the questions that had to be answered in that particular <laughs> mystery. Yeah. That was so God. Oh, Where is like, the local then, McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> when can I yeah. get there? Who will How be serving me my I burger? Save with this coupon. <laughs> can I get a uh, big, uh, uh, big size? Well, like, How, How many <laughs> hours is this? <laughs> How does and, the a know, big meatball the falls onto spaghetti as red wine is poured? Da, 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 da. Did you get to that part? Yet? Like, you no. know, the, the, the Elizabeth Theranos one, which I'm like, we needed another episode because like there was this <sighs> there was this older Svengali type guy involved that we never dived that much into his background. Who I'm like, there's a lot more to that. Like that was tied into a lot of political people and everything else for, you know, uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And like, I'm like, it's just, that's like, I, I'm like, this was a huge story. This is more, this had more impact than maybe McMillions did, you know? Well, yeah. I, I mean, and then, you know, in, in the vow, they're doing all this stuff and they're talking about all these people. And then it's like, Oh yeah. Keith Rainier had a wife and, and also she like died of cancer. And it's like, like what, 
Nobody else has any, like, we, we, we just, like, pop, 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 like, five minutes. Yeah, you know, kid. she mattered did they a lot get to, to Did they people. get to the kid yet? Did they get to, get to his kid yet? No. No, not yet. Oh, Keith Rainer had a kid, too. But they, yeah, uh, sorry, had a kid. They, they, they have gotten to the part where whatever the mom of the of the current uh, 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 India that they're trying to uh, rescue, they're like, I got a message from India. It says, I am in a happy relationship, and I am okay with what is happening how are we gonna fix this guys <laughs> like I don't gang know. we gotta get on the case like <laughs> all right all right first things first let's think about it <laughs> second who's got the pinot grigio <laughs> third can we get to the backyard is it nice or do i need a windbreaker how much would it cost to get more pinot grigio <laughs> where can i source more pinot grigio <laughs> All right, you guys want to do a weird thing? Yeah, ready. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Andrew, I'm going to count you in. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Uh, Gentlemen, um, I don't know about you. When I was a kid, I loved space. I loved rockets. Oh, well, thank goodness right? you gave that up. Yeah, I know. But I, I wasn't one of those jerks that got to go to space camp. <laughs> All right. I've been a little personal. That's fine. <laughs> oh, I forgot, Brian. You went to space camp. You were yeah. one of those lucky kids yeah. that got to go to space camp. I also, I um, also went and she, performed at the university and got to go back again to space camp as an adult. <laughs> it's great. That's great, Brian. Just really happy my friends could have these experiences. It's great. Um, uh, what about this though, Brian? Um, did you get to touch a rocket? Did you get to see a rocket like up close? I mean, I mean, the uh, uh, the Huntsville campus has like you know literally you know uh, dozens and dozens, and you know you got to see the prototype oh. for the for the nuclear fueled one that was intended to go to Mars. And oh wait, wait, wait! I'm sorry, you said the campus. Oh, so you had to go, you had to go travel to go see this, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stayed there for a week. It was it was really great. I mean, oh. yeah. well, you know, some Chinese students, they got an up close view of a rocket um, last week and they didn't have to go very far, Brian. They could stand at their own school and watch as a Long March 4B rocket launched and then crashed not that far away from their school. And they got an up close view of this, Brian. Uh, whoopsie. Wo I mean, hoorazy doodle. I don't know. Wait, what is the right <laughs> <laughs> response on this? <laughs> Wow. Well, All Brian. right. So, yeah, this is a, a Chinese rocket launch ends in failure. But how, where are they launching it that it's that close to a school? That, that seems like a well, poor idea. They, they, one, China. Two, they launch from, they launch from inland, right? And uh, they have a habit of sometimes if there's a town not far from where they launch their rockets from, then hey, these people get a great view. Cool. Uh, in this case, this is not the first time we've, I think we saw some footage before of a rocket that crashed like on the middle of a road. You see pieces of the rocket on the road. Here, they're using the hydrazine gas, which is, gives that toxic orange cloud. And you look at some of the photos of this and you see like, like from the school, you see this orange cloud. That's the thing that like when we have that, we clear everybody as far back as possible from. You know, China, it's like a couple guys in hazmat suits hose it down and then like, all right, everybody's good to go. Is is um, the hydrazine the same stuff that uh, is a plot device in the Martian? Is in that what he uses to make oxygen or water from and then does too yeah, much? Yeah, I think he splits apart the hydrazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, which was unnecessary given the Martian. That's we, fine. It's also couldn't happen. <laughs> No, but it's it, it, it's 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 one of those things that you're like. If you, oh my you're god! Like, you, you... That is a rocket falling yeah. to the planet. Oh ah! my god! Ah! <laughs> so we're seeing the orange cloud from a street. Yeah, we're the seeing orange, debris. The toxic orange cloud. Oh dear! There's a shot of the There's orange cloud the with the school in the foreground. Oh <laughs> dear! Jiminy. That's so yeah, like the, really uh, that, close. That, the yelling that you heard was uh, the compilation video going from a falling celestial body to then just a gigantic plume of awful smoke and destruction. <laughs> and it, it looks right now like the first part of when SpaceX lands a rocket. Now it doesn't because it's starting to go sideways and it, yeah. the thrusters haven't turned on and now there's a big 
Bloom. Wow. Were, were they trying to? I assume they were trying to go to space. That's a dumb thing for me yes. to say. <laughs> they did. <laughs> this was yeah. not. This was not. Orange like, uh, cloud successful. <laughs> exactly. Back yeah. it up. So no, wait, my question so was like they I, were I, trying so, to, so, to so, land. Scientifically rocket. speaking, was this for funsies? <laughs> That's not what I meant. You understand or what I meant. Or was it for realsies? <laughs> they, they, Answer the question, <laughs> sir. Answer the question. I didn't know. We've watched a lot of SpaceX star, you know, hops, and I didn't know if it yeah. was sure. one of those. But gotcha. but but no, apparently they were really shooting for the stars and didn't 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 make it. Oh, yeah. They landed among the so, orange clouds. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, when you reach for the stars, sometimes you just end up in a cloud sometimes you uh, yeah end up in a chinese school gymnasium oh my god so china has a very and they've made a lot of progress in their space industry now i want to make that clear they've 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 made a lot of rapid progress they've took uh they started a lot of the soviet era designs they've been iterating on that trying to develop their own we think they launched a space plane recently but you know being military and secretive they haven't quite you know we don't have the full details on that kind of like our X-37B, which we've been using for decades to test things on. So it looks like they just launched something like that. Uh, they do they do have a splody sort of problem, um, which uh, not to say that we haven't gone through that either, but there is like, there's some of their rockets have to have a kind of a higher rate of that, but they're making like, a lot like, of progress like, Just try to spell the name Elon Musk with four less F words. Uh, uh, that's how, like, they, they, they fairly have fewer Fs to give about whether or not something yeah. makes it harder, faster. Well, I mean, there's also, you know, there is a thing to be said about certain engineering cultures and stuff, too. Like, you look at, you look at the problems that we had, you know, we've had, like, with the shuttle, where we've had a couple instances where we knew there were design flaws, but the ability for that to make it all the way up there was systemic problems of like, no, we think this is the margin error margin. And some engineers like, no, no, that's that's not what it should be. Like, nope, we've got the document right here. It says you're wrong. And then it blows up and it's like, oh, that document doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and, you know, um, a lot of like our own cover on our butts on stuff. So in there, I think that it's even, I don't, I don't, you know, you don't want to be the engineer that has to say we can't launch today, you know, when it's a really important launch. So, but but they've made progress and they're ambitious about space. So I, I, I you know, I respect towards that. And I don't want to be like, ha ha, look at them. But no, uh, launching stuff close to schools, yeah, maybe not the best idea. But man. That would be, I mean, all right. Can we imagine if this were in the United States, like what, what we would be looking at in terms of fallout, in terms of who would be fired, like that this would be, a massive story, right? Like well, this would be a story look, that that would go on for for weeks or months. No, the story would be that 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 uh, thank goodness that there are no kids in that school because we're all staying home <laughs> on our Zoom meetings. But fair but point. For context, for context, I was told that SpaceX took several years to get permission to launch from Vandenberg because there was a, a threatened snail near the launch pad. Yeah, like literally because of an environmental impacts involving a snail. Nothing against snails, and it's like that don't happen in China. You got a GD By the school way, in the way, and they're launching. The threatened snail wasn't even threatened with its life. It was threatened. There, there was there was collateral that was about to be released that would be very <laughs> embarrassing for that snail. Yes, yes, for that snail who had made a vow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that uh, is, uh, I, I, I can't even wrap my head around the idea of something that would need as high level and thorough sign offs from city, state, federal, uh, uh, all of the agencies that deal with our current orbital path through space. Like there are few actions in our current system that require as many people to sign off on them than a space launch from every form of government. The idea that that something would fall very, very close to a school is just crazy. Like, like that would be heads. Heads would roll. They yeah. might have. <laughs> fair point. That's a fair point. I, 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 was, in, I was in China, and I, was, I had a, a, a friend who 
she was from Hong Kong. Her husband was from like, I think Belgium. And he worked at this company and they made something. And he, it was a Chinese company and he went to go work with them from Europe because they were like the best Chinese company building this stuff. You know, because he talks about like Chinese companies, like a lot of them just sort of mass produce stuff with a lot of tolerances all over the place. This was the best. He went to go work with them. And they had, they were talking about, they're, they're having a meeting and they're, they're in their meeting at the factory and they need to expand. And every big company like that, there's a party member who's on the board of directors, the way it works. There's a party member who's a member of that. And they're talking about, we could need to expand. And there was a, uh, next door, there was a residential area, like, like small, like kind of like huts or sort of like smaller homes and stuff like this. And they're like, yeah, it would be nice if we could, uh, expand into that area you know if we could we could make deals with them and get the property there and then we could build more factory and build more warehouses and like is that agreed like yeah let's go this is what we need to do next steps and he says i went to work the next day that afternoon and that lot was empty uh they get they get stuff done <laughs> and i mean imagine we... yeah living there Knock, knock. You gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Time to move. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. That is crazy. You want to know what else is crazy? The relationship we have with you, the listener. Why I think to myself, I must be going nuts uh, 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 trying to get you guys all of the entertainment that you deserve each and every Monday. And the way that you guys repay us is at patreon.com slash weird things head on over there now get your custom rss feed make sure that you never miss an episode and get some custom discord rewards as well patreon.com slash weird things gentlemen yes can you smell that can you smell that is it hydrazine <laughs> because i can run uh. very fast <laughs> <laughs> no brian it's not hydrazine this is phosphine phosphine i know exciting exciting uh, phosphine the, in what? the venus Fo atmosphere uh, 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 pho pho phos i don't know what phosphine is but i know that phos phosphorescence is a, does it glow is it a glowy thing well brian i'm gonna pretend to know all about phosphine because i read the article and, uh, <laughs> about phosphine oh sure. geez what about their early works? You know, about the European album? That was really good. Um, so uh, phosphine is a gas that they've detected in the atmosphere of Venus, and scientists say that it's usually indicating life. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So um, uh, uh, go on. It, it would well, be the, the equivalent. Like, I know, that, I know that oxygen is one of those things that, uh, that you pretty much don't get oxygen without without something making oxygen, something living making it, right? Which is why- Yeah, high, large amounts of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why we're able to look at exoplanets and if if, if we're ev ev ever able to find an exoplanet with a whole bunch of oxygen, that almost certainly would be an indication of, of life on there, right? Yeah, and, and, and just as a note, um, and I'm totally not reading from this Wikipedia, in the pilot episode of Breaking Bad, Walter White knocked out Crazy Eight and killed Emilio Coyoma by generating phosphine gas. <laughs> mm, that's a good poll. Yeah. Uh, so the the presence of it, it seems to be it's you know a thing. As far as we understand it, it's generally produced through like organic chemistry and to detect it large amounts. Some scientists are saying that. Um, eh, like that, that's. That'd be one of the things we consider a hallmark for some sort of organic process, some form of life. This is from so the Royal life on, Astronomicals. So, 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 so life on Venus, life on Venus, something that, that now more likely based on, on the, the, the detection of this gas. How do you, how do you think that, that looks? I would imagine that, and this is me making, totally speculating, making up stuff. Uh, stop me if you've heard me do this before uh but but like you know there's there's talk about everything from um uh i, I don't know floating clouds uh of of of, of uh, organic matter on on jupiter or whatever it seems like we all know that the surface of venus is a hellscape but we also know that at some point there's going to be a goldilocks zone and so mm -hmm. it it doesn't seem like the craziest thing to just imagine sort of a 
a floating, uh, a, 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 like an ionosphere of, 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 of green things that are, that are making it maybe, I don't know. Yeah, there's, it, it's entirely possible. You know, one of the things that we kind of forget is that you can take air samples as high up as you can get air, um, which actually goes, even extends, like you find air molecules even past the International Space Station. I think we've talked about this before that the ISS actually changes the pitch of its solar panels at certain parts of its rotate orbit because of drag. And the uh, uh, tiny presence, but like we find stuff up up our atmosphere. You know, we find little things, little, little buggers living up there that sometimes waft from down here, but we don't know a lot about upper atmosphere sort of, you know, biology as much as we you know probably are going to learn and we also know that things can sort of you know we get like solar winds go by and will strip away parts of our upper like little small pockets and bubbles of like our upper atmosphere and they go towards other places mars and so there's different there's asteroids hitting us and sending debris elsewhere but there's also the exchange of some of parts of atmosphere to other places so it's possible that you could have Life could seed from here to there, from Mars to here to there, et cetera. Well, and, and we've even, so. you know, sp speculated about, wondered what it might look like for, you know, kind of a cloud city, floating city on over, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you, you would never want to fall down into Venus. But uh, but at some point, uh, there has to be a Goldilocks, uh, fairly pleasant temperature, if not atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, that, that maybe is cozy to, to some kind of critter that that's able to make something well and we have you know we have life that lives in geothermal vents you know we have extremophiles yeah. and so that was that was a big that re that realigned a lot of our thinking of where we thought life was possible and then we keep looking everywhere we find you know we talk about lithotropes life that lives within rocks and that eats rocks etc and so it's hard to say like other than we get complete other than we get like the complete breakdown of chemistry I, I don't know, or the complete breakdown or no, almost no molecular motion. I'm hard. I'm hesitant to say what the limit would be. Well, and uh, uh, we certainly know that there's more energy uh, in Venus, full stop, you know, being closer to the sun, um, being bathed in, in, you know, all, all, all that, that sunlight. Uh, like if I was going to, if I was just going to imagine where I'd find a microscopic, a microscopic, critter i i think i might pick venus before mars well remember that and the thing that works really to venus's favor is the atmosphere trapping the heat and that's why mercury gets colder than venus does because Ven mercury is much closer to the sun than than venus is so but you know venus having that thick atmosphere which one means you get the heat trapping effect but also heat thick atmosphere means chemicals other things and, and we're used to thinking of our atmosphere as sort of static we have our atmosphere we get some cloud layers and stuff although we know it's not really like that for stratosphere and stuff like that and venus it's going to be much more you got to think of your atmosphere almost like an ocean like layers to an ocean and completely different gradients completely different chemical compositions and stuff weather patterns above weather patterns etc and if, if i'm remembering right uh venus is is tidally locked where a day is longer than a year so there's one side that's kind of constant constantly always being baked or whatever so uh, i don't know that that to me sort of opens up even more possibility of of if we're you know just postu uh, postulating a, a, a microscopic something or other a lot of lot of Goldilocks zones, I would imagine. Yeah, it's not it's not tidally locked. Um, it it orbits actually counterclockwise, like the way we orbit, and also with the atmosphere, the convection from that uh, pushes heat uh, around it traditionally. Oh shoot! Okay, so yeah, so there's plenty of spinning uh, happening. Yeah, there. there's no cold. Yeah, I don't parts. know if there was. Yeah, no, no. It, it's like that's where where Mercury's fascinating because like Mercury gets like. Uh, there are parts, and Mercury's not tidal active either, but Mercury has a polar points that like when you have a slight axis that stay in shadow for periods of time, and you could probably get snow on Mercury. Wow. You know, or ice yeah. at some points there. Uh, I, remember there was, <laughs> I remember in one of the Star Wars books, uh, Lando Calrissian was running a mining operation uh, on a Mercury-like type planet uh, where basically it was just a giant tank 
that was just you know constantly staying on on just the edge of of the sun coming up mm -hmm. over it so uh it, where it's like hey weather's fine here as long as we keep on moving it's me another crazy scheme of mining Lando. <laughs> mining so, baron uh, lando calrissian but a, a venus day is 243 earth days yeah so the damn so the long I, shift i was uh, gonna say yeah so phosphines are are uh, i think that would finally it would finally uh, benefit me for uh, just telling people that i'll get to it tomorrow <laughs> yeah i'm at the venus tomorrow hey that's that's gonna be like <laughs> smash cut to me at the irs building <laughs> like <laughs> uh, all right what do you expect? It's only Monday. It's only Monday. Just handcuffs. Take me up to jail. <laughs> Stunning so, defense yeah. falls flat. <laughs> so when we see, apparently when we see, when we encounter phosphine in nature, it is organically produced. And so that's where we're like, oh, there. But of course, like, we've got this literal oven with an entirely different environment, atmosphere, and chemical makeup on Venus. It's sort of like, we, we, you know, like maybe life, maybe a chemical process that we haven't had the opportunity to observe yet because we haven't, you know, run that model yet. I guess so. that's a similar, uh, uh, isn't most of the methane on planet earth created by organic life, whereas, you know, mm -hmm. Titan has entire, you know, methane rainfalls and rivers and lakes of it and stuff. Exactly. And that's one of the things where, uh, when we, we look at like, because there is the argument, there's an argument like there, and I don't know how much weight it still holds about talking about like how much of like our natural gas was actually produced from organic matter versus abiotic, whatnot. And there is some, there are some debate as to like, do we really fully understand some of the geoscience behind that? Because did we just sort of settle in to say this is the way it's done? And, and I heard some of it was kind of been debunked, but it was this interesting idea. I did. Of like, I, did I, I remember. I remember listening. This is some coast to coast AM, middle of the night AM radio stuff. There was somebody very passionately saying that, uh, uh, talking about a, a, abiotic uh, uh, crude oil. Like he was saying, like yeah. you know, we call it a fossil fuel because we assume it's all dead, decayed matter. But that's not it. It's there's you know it, there's all of it that we will ever need forever, and there will never be peak oil or whatever. Yeah, that was that was an argument for a while, and I don't, I haven't followed up to see that, and because I, I read one of these things like, no, this is why it's not true, whatever. I'm like, I don't, I don't know, but I know, <laughs> I do know that we're, we're we have plenty of oil right now, and plenty of natural gas, and it's 2020, and we're supposed to have run out of all those things by now. Um, but also, sort of thinks that like, how, you know, anyhow, uh, very interesting, very interesting. Uh, yeah, in my imagination, like Andrew gets far enough into the article to just say. Yeah, I'm not writing that book right now. <laughs> and then just keeps no. on going to the next one. Yeah, uh, I'll, I, yeah, I, I, okay, cool. Science, yay. <laughs> Let me yeah. know when you have an answer. Uh, but it is exciting. And I mean, it, it's, it's exciting too, because where we are right now with, uh, we're literally watching, you know, in, uh, you know, SpaceX is planning to do a, 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 a I think a 60,000 foot hop with their you know in the next week or two with a proper nose cone like like a, like yep. looking like a real spaceship not not just the random floating grain silo that that we've seen so far yeah and there was a let me see what the, the latest is so for those who don't know Although um it's space it, it does even even like even with the nose cone i mean just it i i deeply adore how homegrown that thing looks it just looks like someone went out there with some 10 penny nails and and a dream uh and, and i know yeah. there's so much more to it but i love how how rough hewn it appears yeah so from elon two days ago sn8 the serial number eight that each one of these things you see hopping they've got different versions and we watched they're always building the next one so see one blow up and it's like eh, all right roll the other one out you know, and that's sort of the beauty of it. It's not like the one prototype we have that we've, the NASA approach would be like, make sure you measure every single, you know, every every single seam 10 times, do this, whatever. There's reasons for doing that. But the SpaceX approach is like, yes, take due caution, build it well, but just test a thing, test a thing. Just put it on the stand and see what happens. I mean, sometimes just, it goes it's, floating. It's just so dented. 
and homespun. It looks like it looks like it's about to start singing in a third grade play. I love oh, it. <laughs> I I remember like like if I made this as a prop and I showed up, you know, the the producers came to see this thing, I'd get fired. Yes, like, yeah, I know. yeah, but. Did you ever look at the space shuttle up close? Oh sure, yeah, no, it's it's uh, uh yeah, those individual tiles look like they're uh, they're they're um they 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 were stolen from a, a Passover ceremony. I mean, they're all like little biscuits. It looks like it looks like it's paper mache. It yeah. looks like you see these things. You look at the side, and it looks quilted and even. I'm like, and you get closer, you're like, oh. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> you know? like, this is not. I wanted to see something sleek and cool, but. As you know, SpaceX's SpaceX's attitude on this is like, oh, uh, we just need these things to have fuel tanks and engines right now. We'll worry about making the thing smooth and pretty later on. Let's just because part of it too, it's like our reaction to this. Imagine if you were, you know, Lockheed or whatever, and you you NASA brought in Senator so and so to go take a look at this thing, and they're like, you know, we gave you ten billion dollars for this. You know, yeah, but that's but that's the difference in in the business model, right? Like uh, yep. uh, Boeing and Lockheed aren't doing stuff on spec. And if they are, it's going to be something that they are going to put a gigantic price tag on. So no one can see the stuff until it all looks awesome. Uh, so there was a uh, Eric Berger as a comment, he writes on Ars Tech and talks about space. Uh, he, he, the quote for the headline was Charlie Bolden says the quiet part out loud. SLS rocket will go away. So Bolden, who was head of NASA for a uh, previous NASA administrator, he had uh, said back when there was talk about like SLS, which is the rocket we have spent <laughs> billions and billions of dollars. Oh, a number oh, this more was going to be like the next generation space shuttle, right? This, yeah, well, yeah, which, which, which was uh, derisively, uh, although not unfairly, nicknamed the Senate launch system because yeah, it is and, and, uh, and, a, a, yeah, a classic boondoggle. So in, in space shuttle in a sense that totally not reusable, totally, you know, they were basically, basically it was a works program for like previous shuttle contractors and stuff. So. In 2000, this Berger had sort of some comment on this because he interviewed Bolden back in 2014, and he asked him, and this is 2014, he had asked why was NASA investing so much in SLS when SpaceX was using its own funds to develop the lower cost Falcon Heavy rocket? Bolden said at the time, let's be very honest, we don't have a commercially available heavy lift vehicle. The Falcon 9 Heavy may someday come about. It's on the drawing board. SLS is real. Mmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that um, one you can add that one to freezing cold takes. That's that's uh yeah. that one that one did not age well. Yeah, yeah. So those of you didn't know, the the Falcon Heavy's launched twice now. SLS, uh, the the best case scenario is at least end of next year before it will launch, which nobody really expects that. And it's yet we've had the second time within like twelve months of another multi billion dollar cost overrun. Man, what's it got to be like to be part of the team doing that where it's like you just know and ah that's that's got to be a rough gig well, well no, i mean it's, thing, it's i think it's it's, it's a gig it's a, it's a cozy yeah, yeah no, no you're, it you're, is you're, no you're right, like, right yeah no they can be really really sad in a new house because they know <laughs> they are going to be getting x amount of money for y amount of time and that's that's what it is i mean the relationships that these kinds of companies have with the federal government uh, is not one where they got to worry about like making a thing like, so or I, being on time or, or on budget. I I've watched and like burger. I love uh burgers coverage. Cause I've watched him cover for the over years. And there's that always that like, well, you know, Elon Musk says a lot of stuff he needs to deliver. You know, Elon Musk says, and which is true. It's it's like, you know, this guy is like, I'm going to build electric cars and rockets and wire your brain. I'm like, all right, slow down there, buddy. <laughs> and then there has been this sort of like, and let's see what is. colonies beneath the ground. <laughs> and... Yeah, and it's, yeah, but as he's delivered, and, and, and I think that there was these, you sort of a lot of people sort of step back and be like, I've seen critics now go, yeah, no, we're we're on board with the space part at least, whatever. But this is my this is this is Berger's not a guy as far as I know to sort of throw shade. But this is what he says about he has a caption a title here. It says view of the SLS outside the bubble. 
And it talks about like heavy, the Falcon Heavy is not as capable of SLS, but can do a ton of the missions SLS is meant for. But then the last sentence in the first paragraph, the SLS will cost two billion, cost about two billion to launch and then fall into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That wasn't actually the mission statement for it, but it is this. <laughs> well, and and look, I think it's a credit. It's a credit to where we are in terms of rocketry that 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 is a punchline and not a like. Well, of course, but of, uh, where else would you want a rocket? Where, to where go? else would your seven thirty seven go? You get on over Paris and then fall, yeah. jump out, and parachute. All the passengers parachute out, and then it crashes in the Alps somewhere. Yeah, um, I forgot they've done three Falcon Heavy launches. I've got another one coming up, um, I think sometime next year too. Uh, and that was, so what was interesting, I think it's worth mentioning too, the Falcon Heavy took longer to develop because they were going to do some interesting stuff like cross feed, like have fuel going from the side rockets into the main rocket and some other sorts of stuff, which they dialed back on. And Elon Musk could, you know, cause he originally thought like, oh, I'd be like just three rockets strapped together. And he's like, no, it's more complicated than that. But also, they improved the efficiency of the Falcon 9 like by 30 or 40 percent of the amount of the payload capacity where they thought they would need the Falcon Heavy to do a lot of these heavier payloads. And it turned out the Falcon 9 could be made even more efficient. And that was one of the reasons why it took them, you know, one of the reasons why the, the push towards the Falcon Heavy wasn't as much was they were surprised by the performance of that. That's crazy. So, so I'm wondering now, uh, I can go to the capability and services and see like, what does it cost to, oh, okay, to, to, a Falcon Heavy launch, um, eight metric tons to a geo, uh, GTO, geosynchronous transfer orbit, um, 90 million, 90 million. Eight metric tons. Uh, it, how, how close is a metric ton to what I think of as a ton, 2,000 pounds? Yeah, we call it the same. Pretty, pretty much, well, okay, whatever. So eight tons. So, yeah, okay, let's, let's think in terms of Jeeps. Uh, you, you, you can send up... <laughs> It's all of up. Brian's math. All of Brian's math is <laughs> cheap related. Up, uh, it's just, well, I don't know. Oh, I mean, uh, based uh, on my tw- calculations, that's 24? 18 Jeeps and three wine marauders. Wine marauders. And, yeah. and two it's hard drives high. with the Abyss <laughs> carry, carry the Hearthstone and uh, Eureka. <laughs> Yeah, throw in some iPads and uh, we're about covered. All right, yeah, I got it. All right, works. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, um, ninety million to do again. There are there are configurations for SLS which are going to be uh, heavier payloads than the Falcon Heavy can carry. That's for sure. But also. If you knew you were going to have the Falcon Heavy capability, then you probably would have designed payloads to that, to match that. And that was a lot of NASA things. NASA's like, oh, well, you know, we have to have the SLS because this thing's only going to fit on the SLS. Why Why did you design it for that, you know? reason Because we needed, we wanted to have the SLS. You know, it's like... Just, it's just a bygone era, right? Yeah. And and I think that that's, that's a... a <laughs> it, it's a credit to the private space industry that we've moved the needle, uh, uh, that the move, the, the needle has been moved as far as it is, but it also shows you exactly why the needle was stuck in the position that it was stuck in for as long as it was, because these are, you know, uh, you are, you are deciding these kinds of things that are only really decided once every several years based on factors that aren't exactly uh, propulsive to use a rocket pun. So here's one of the examples, like to Mar, it could send uh, to low Earth orbit. Again, I was using the GTO, which is the transfer thing, to low Earth orbit, 140,000 pounds. 140,000 pounds. Uh, I don't know how many Jeeps is that? About 30, <laughs> maybe 30, 30 Jeep chair. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 Jeeps. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. That'd be great, a fleet. <laughs> like, I, I can't wait, take I can't down wait Star until Brian Man. go fire Jeeps. <laughs> Brian, in, in, in 10 years, when you sell like modern rogue to Warner, or you just get like this gigantic payout, this like billion dollar buyout, and you're just like, well, Brian, what do you do next? And he's just like, 
oh i know like <laughs> van halen starts playing it's 30 <laughs> jeeps just spread <laughs> out <laughs> into space <laughs> wait is that a white marauder in a spacesuit <laughs> he asked for, for it he asked for it uh so uh yeah um and so when you have the former head of nasa sort of quietly saying because like ah, basically it's going to go away meaning um all that money all of that money which you know like well, said, but, but again you don't you don't get to know who the winner was going to be in advance you know i mean it's like uh i mean uh, I, I, I don't know maybe there were, there were, some were... inner city stem schools <laughs> you know it's yeah i mean look, look, uh uh the 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 thing here is it one person winning or losing ultimately the greatest benefit to this is part is some of the military industrial complex being loosened at least in terms of space exploration it, it's a win for people who want more space ex exploration it's a win for people who want uh, more science done and it's a win for people that uh don't believe that this kind of money should just be uh, uh written off out of the federal budget so uh well, yeah, the, I think the, the, the big, the, the big, the big win, the big win is that we have a gigantic failure that this didn't even come close to being competitive with other off the rack options. Yeah, like, that's the a problem's not that win. the problem's not that we wanted to build a big giant rocket. That's great. I love that. The problem was is that it's the cost plus the idea that we went to some contractors and said, "You've got the gig." And you've now you've known over decades that unfortunately, if you have if you don't deliver on time and it keeps changing and keeps having cost overruns, we're still going to pay for it. What do you think will happen? And that's the frustrating part. Not that we wanted to build this in, but you know, SLS on paper to have a big heavy lift rocket like that would be great. The way we went about doing it, completely wrong, and we got exactly what the program was designed for: to keep putting money into these contractors for years and never yeah. deliver anything. And then what finally rocked. they ever did, yeah, a two billion dollar per launch thing, you know, and it, it, but and there's you know people made that thing like well like you know you know we didn't know reusability was a thing like nobody was spending money on reusability no nobody we we stopped spending money on genuine reusability like in the early seventies when we realized that the space shuttle was supposed to be a fully reusable rocket and we realized to get this thing done in time we had to cut some corners and ever since then. It was off the table for the most part. You put like money in Delta Clipper and some other things, but it was just every now. Fun times. Picks? I uh, finally started watching season two of The Boys. Uh, you guys watching The Boys on, on, the, on Amazon? Uh, Brian, Not, my yet. pick is uh, season one of The Boys oh, <laughs> because it... Ashley hadn't seen it. Oh, right so on. I am rewatching season one of the boys. And let me tell you this. I was just as charmed in, in this go round as I was on uh, uh, the first time that I watched it. Uh, some of the ideas of the first season are obviously very much inspired by the time in which they were written. They were, they were very much about, uh, you know, uh, a certain point in history. Uh, others, I think, have aged exceptionally well, including the idea of, like, Disney becoming a defense contractor. Uh, but uh, uh, by and large, man, the, the cast, just just so well. So well cast. Like, I, there's, there's not a character in that show that we come to where I'm like, oh, we have to do a thing with them now? Like, everyone's got at least some kind of nuance and the people that are are uh really well cast are just out of this world to me like they are iconic yeah the uh, uh i had a friend ask if uh he he got like four episodes into it and he expressed that it was just just too dark and awful and and asked whether or not um there ever was any joy and by being so dark and so awful so early it really does buy them the rest of the season to get a little bit wacky at times and going into the second season, maybe a little lot wacky and still not minding it uh, because of just how harsh that opening is. Uh, I, I'm enjoying the second season quite a bit.
Andrew? Oh, I think Andrew's muted because he probably didn't want to hear. Oh, uh, gotcha. yeah. Oh, Andrew's, got it. Andrew's muted. <laughs> Old I can, I'm uh, here. I, I heard everything, guys. <laughs> uh, I just, I hear there's certain things I go, beep. I'll just yeah. wait. We are, we are aware. We are aware. Do you have a pick? Uh, my pick is, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little helpful feature. Um, uh, suppose you're watching like classic Star Trek episodes with your girlfriend who's never seen them before. And then you're like, yeah, you know, there's a whole culture of people who literally have built extremely realistic sets and make their own episodes and will even hire former cast members or the children of cast members to be in their Star Trek fan films. And you decide to show them this on YouTube and you realize, oh man, I should have paused my watch history. <laughs> Why? Oh, oh, because now you're getting fed nothing but fan yeah, films. Now you're getting <laughs> all of these. So the YouTube uh, watch history. Yeah. Um, I highly recommend po using that to pause things so that you don't get recommendations of, I don't know, every friggin' Star Trek fan film made ever. Um, it's, 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 <laughs> have you seen the level of suspense? i watched i was watching one and i'm like like there's called what like star trek continues which like they've got like a full set for the bridge they've got a med base set they've got a transporter room set they've got the uh conference room set like they've got like i don't know i'm sure somebody here knows the full story on this but like i imagine like somewhere in like north carolina somebody's built their entire yeah, you know, we talked about before about the whole Axnar thing where people you know, they wanted to make a Star Trek fan film and they started raising money on it like a legit film to build a studio and stuff. And Paramount's like, we think this kind of crosses a line, you know? Um, but there are there still are Star Trek fan films and stuff, and holy crap, the production quality on these things. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to make some guesses about the acting quality, but I'm going to make other guesses about... What a freaking blast they're probably having. <laughs> like, like, I mean, well, it has to be so was, much fun. Well, I was watching one and there and you see uh like Chris Duhan, who's Jimmy Duhan's like son, who you know, he will play, he plays his dad's role on them. He'll go in and do this. And then Grant Amahara was playing Sulu. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Grant so it was like a super big Trek fan. And, you know, it's like, I wonder who we're gonna cast him as. Oh, okay, well, I guess we could just, you know, follow that trend. <laughs> but uh um you know, that's the thing too. It's like maybe they're out there, but I'm like, I wanna see like the gender bending versions of stuff. Like, I wanna see, like, let's not continue the 1968 show. Let's redo this show in some other well, kind of cool way, but maybe that's not the point. I kind of wonder also, like, at a certain point, do we look at those as like 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 repertory? properties like and obviously there's like an element of like trying to make money off it but just saying like oh in the same way that shakespeare is just a thing that people need to do if they are like certain actors if you want to make sci-fi films should it just be like a rite of passage that you direct a star trek script or something like that or should we have public access sets that people can go and and, and shoot this kind of uh, stuff on and and should we then take the same kind of licenses that you do with Shakespeare that's been done to death and so that's why you get the modern version or the medieval or the or the you know whatever version yeah, I mean you uh, you, you are describing my paradise that that legally uh cannot happen but uh but 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 only exists well legally you can't largest. make money on it right well, yes, like, legally correct, you correct. can't make money on it and you can't call it blank but it's like all right uh to a certain extent if it's just spaceship the the journey to adventure yeah and everybody's doing everyone's doing the same thing on, like, i'm gonna, I'm gonna trademark is. spaceship the journey to adventure <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you're paramount is actually and and you know we there is you'll see stuff like people were angry when they like shut down like axnar or whatever but i mean that was like i would say that's an example where you literally had people paying themselves salaries and to release a product using the star trek ip in ways that I would say really push the limits of what would be acceptable fandom kind of thing, because it's like, what's the difference between that? And, and yeah, and that's the sort of thing is you have to say, like, if I go raise money to go make, I'm going to make a Star Trek, we're calling a fan film, but I'm going to get paid. I'm going to do this. We're going to use this IP and we're going to sell videos and merchandise and stuff. Problematic, you know, because then you're, what, what do copyrights mean at that point? But you have a lot of latitude. Like you look at 
if you want to pull up Bryce, pull up uh if you can, like like uh you know, we had somebody in the chat room you're like, oh, I love Star Trek Continue. He was like, i it looks looks you freeze a frame, it looks like some people faithfully acting out and the, the lighting was just as technicolor, super bright as it was in the sixties show. And it is a weird kind of nostalgia here, but like uh they do multiple episodes of this thing, you know, and like you see the sets and stuff and all that, and like uh like that's that looks Holy like crap. Classic. Yeah. Looks great. Yeah. 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 Looks like classic but, Trek. You know, it looks like. Yeah. I guess like, is there a 2020 version of community theater for something like this? Yeah. But, but like, even community theater charges a ticket price. So it's like, so, well, no, but also they charge for the book, right? Like, you know, if you want to yeah. do a thing, you have to pay the rights to get the thing. So it's like, there is some level of sub copyright uh, a blessing. Yeah, like if you if you want to do Greece, that. you just have to pay five dollars per script for everyone in your uh, high Whatever school production. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or well, if you want to do a community we, theater thing, like there's just there's money this, to do it. Isn't this that version though? Because now you have you have people who go do they put together the money to do their own costumes, do their stuff. Somebody's yeah. got sets that they can rent, and then they go to cons, and the cons have like whole like screenings of stuff there, and you put it out there on YouTube and stuff, and. I mean, I think we kind of have that in a sense. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and and and, and I'm not familiar enough with it to know exactly oh. where we're at, but but you, uh, you, that seems like that's what it is. There's a Star Trek: The Next Generation one, and you've got to see this because it is like it starts off. They have their own version of the of the bridge, and there's this skinny bald guy playing, you know, the part of the Picard guy. He's got a British accent. There's a Riker looking dude, and this very Sturdis thing. Swear to God, you think it's an opening to a porn. The way this, you look at this, like, Star Trek Next Generation <laughs> fan film. like it Definitely like, not the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the un uh, the uh, the unauthorized thing. If you find that one, like, that was just this, you know, my brain, like, neurons in my brain started melting. Yeah. I'm like, is, this feels like the Turkish, uh, there actually is, like, Turkish language versions, too. Bryce, please, go forth and find the next generation fan film that looks most like pornography. <laughs> I did find, so I did find this one, A Tale of Two Cities, and the description says it was, was originally made as a porn parody with Whoa! the porn scenes removed. So I don't know exactly if this is what you're looking for, Andrew, but uh, it's called Maybe, A Tale yeah, of Two Maybe, yeah, go back to, that would explain, if you go back to, like, where you see the bridge crew or whatever. Um, um yeah. That, yes, that explains everything now. Ah! <laughs> now okay. <laughs> okay. Thank God. I'm like, why does this feel like a board? It was. It was actually a board. I mean, wow. the holiday. on YouTube, but this was on this, this is on YouTube. So if you go look, yes. like that's good. Yeah, I have a YouTube. Not normally where I look to find porn. Um, but yeah. Oh my God. Yep. That's hilarious. <laughs> yep. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> We're seeing some very particular well, hair Deanna, shots. <laughs> Now when Deanna Troy went, oh, no, oh. Yeah, no, yeah, it makes sense. Were there a lot of Star that Trek is... scenes that took place in bedrooms? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, now, yeah, no, you have, yeah, there's... in quarters, yeah. If you go watch, like, in the Menagerie, there's a scene where uh, uh, Captain Pike goes and lays down his bed, and the doctor walks in, and you're like, this looks, like, this is weird, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? Yeah, I heard you needed to rest. <laughs> I'm like, oh, jeez, you know. But he only gave him martini, so that's amazing. Um, God, makes so much more sense now. Oh, geez, thank you for solving that mystery for me. <laughs> Dude, do you this feel, looks do you like feel porn. just like a big release of all that tension you were carrying? All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Bryce, you got to pick. Oh, sure. Yeah, I got to pick. Uh, I spent over the weekend uh, watching the new episodes of the Netflix original cartoon anime Agretzko, uh, season three has uh, a Gretzko obsessed with a virtual reality boyfriend, loses all of her money on uh, microtransactions, and then ends up uh, having to uh, take a side gig that she is not entirely comfortable with, uh, and then learns a little bit about uh, about herself. About kinda, Star Trek. Kind of not a... This this third season of a Gretzko is very interesting because it's, it's very clear, like, no, she's not, like, a very good friend at all, and everyone is just saying it. And so this is a weird, a weird ending point for, for season three. But it's such a cute show, and it's, uh, you know, they're, they're, like, ten episodes, and all of them are ten minutes long or something like that. So you can, you can get through it really quickly. But uh, I, I'm really digging it. A Gretzko on Netflix. Nice. 
Uh, can I just do a little tack on pick two? Is that uh, Lower Decks continues to delight. It's better than it ought to be. Like it has no right to be as yeah. good as it is. It's uh, it in uh, it's become like must watch family viewing for us. And I don't understand why the IMDb rating isn't higher because uh, like it's note perfect. It's so good. Well, it's a religion. And so, you know, you look at like the review card, which I thought Picard was enjoyable. I enjoyed Picard, but uh, you, you get people who are angry at like, you know, how could they do this to the Federation? Ah, it's not what it means. It's like, oh, I mean, geez, have, have you narrative. seen the Metacritic on the New Testament? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was like, if you look at like on uh, the boys, like a net and uh, within Amazon, the rating for that is like within the own Amazon scoring system, it's like three stars, three and a half. Well, and that and, was that was a big news story because people were review bombing it because they didn't drop the entire season at once. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so now it's at. I was wondering at three why, stars. why they did that. Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Now. So, but, anyhow, but, but uh, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, the joy of lower decks is that um, they they don't the joke isn't remember this like they're really with heart building real episodes with punchy dialogue and fast moving. Uh, stories in the vein of of Star Trek, and and you don't have to know nothing about Star Trek to really get a kick out of it. If, if you know some of the jokes will punch a little bit harder if you happen to know it, but otherwise, highly recommended. Yeah, I like. I don't want to like bag on like Discovery, but like like season two of Discovery just drove me nuts because it was like there's a storyline where the very beginning you're like. Be like, oh, this mystical thing. I'm like, well, we know who that is. We know where this is going to go. And now I got to watch this whole thing unfold for us to get to this point and go, oh, look. And you're like, yeah. Remember when Star Trek was like cool kind of standalone episodes and every now and then we got an arc, you know, and it wasn't yeah. like all arc, you know, no standalone. And But you were like uh, excited for like, oh, I wonder if that's the same thing as the thing before. Like, I'm I'm yeah. excited because I'm picking up this breadcrumb in a world where breadcrumbs shouldn't exist, as opposed to just dumping uncooked Thanksgiving stuffing on the table and being like, look, breadcrumbs. Yeah. I wonder if it'll eventually be a loaf. <laughs> yeah. I, I Have you seen any of the stills and stuff for Strange New Worlds? Mm-mm. So that's the other new Star Trek series they're launching with Anson Mount playing Christopher Pike. Uh, and it's before Kirk had the Enterprise. And so they're, that's the new spinoff from Discovery. And so that's going to be kind of interesting. I hope I hope they're going to do like more standalone stuff. But some like Rebecca Romain, uh, Stamos, she's going to play number one. If you remember, <laughs> hey, nerds, remember, you know, the Menagerie. Remember the, the original crew before Kirk, you know, was... Spock with Pike and then the woman in Major Barrett's character, number one, etc. So uh here's hoping, you know. When it's Star Trek's good, it's really fun. Yeah. When it's not oh. it's been weird. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Too unfunny to be for adults. Childish humor with the lowest common denominator. And it's too insulting yeah. to be for kids, too. No. The it's first perfect. episode even promotes porn. Yeah, it's it's so good. One it's star. great. It's great. Oh my god. Yeah, the oh I had to clean out the hall like, like, you, like she had to clean out the holodeck. <laughs> well and, and, and they don't they don't go overboard on it. It's just implied. If you get it, you get it. We that, honestly do not need a toilet humor version of Star Trek. Oh this is God, a degradation me? of the principles, moral, and educational standpoints our beloved franchise is known for. Boycott this trashy attempt at making a cartoon. Gene Roddenberry would be ashamed of this piece of trash and the fact that they have given authorization to use the oh brand name. God. Go, go back and like, like, go, like, like, go what, back and watch what, the original episode and the, the, those those mini skirt, how high they are and how much side <laughs> boob they try to get away with, you know. Uh, also, I didn't say it in the episode, but it's like they they do such a good job of avoiding the robot chicken problem. Like they're like of just what is the robot chicken problem? Your robot chicken and and um, uh, Family Guy, like their idea reference, of a parody reference. Yeah, reference. yeah it's yeah. like it's Cutaways? like okay. this thing. Remember that? Remember that? Remember that? Yeah. Like they they totally dodge all that, and that's hard to do. It's really good. Uh, 
it's it's really well written and and my they they they're willing to introduce something in the first episode that doesn't pay off until the fourth episode and introduce something in the second episode that they just don't even talk about for a long time. I, I, I thought the strength of the show, I thought was the, how well it balances absurdity to right up to the level. Uh, and, and I look at it sometimes I'll watch really absurd shows. Say like, if somebody was, if they, I lived in a world, the future world, like Star Trek world, and somebody told me, Oh, here's this crazy thing that happened here. I'm like, I don't give me, it'll be a little exaggerated, but I could believe it kind of thing. And then within the realms of Star Trek, nothing's totally crazy. But uh, I, I was thinking, like, man, this show's well built because I'm watching an episode where the one where like Mariner is like, you know, mouthing off and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, that seems very unstarfleet behavior for it. I'm like, this is a parody of Star Trek. And the thing that bothers me the most is because like everybody pretty consistent characters. The world building is very consistent for even how weird and out there it is. Which and then I love that. And then Badgy, you know. Oh the my holodeck. god, Jack Brainer, that was <laughs> the, great. The, the Clippy. <laughs> yeah, that was all great. Right. Uh, all right, here I'll be right back. Oh no, <laughs> dang, dang, dang. <laughs> I was gonna one person off. go. Oh, okay. You, you guys go. You guys go. Okay, you guys okay, go. Okay, right. You guys go. I was I was preparing for that, and then it just Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Trek. <laughs> Star Justin, Trek is nerd. What is it? Was that nerd you? Star shit. Trek is nerd shit? It's nerd yes. shit. They canceled me for it, Justin. <laughs> I'm with you. Bryce, Bryce, welcome to the intellectual dark web. <laughs> the marketplace of ideas has decided I'm Welcome to, to the intellectual dark web. Finally, we will make a new society from the Shadowlands. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, I just... A lot of lot of jokes, but I got a little ratioed on that after. So I meant I called it nerd shit on the Marvel stream. Yeah, and then yeah. I tweeted out about it. It's apologizing for being canceled, um, yeah. and they minorly ratioed me a little bit. Oh, I learned very very quickly doing the Doctor Who podcast is like there are certain things that like you think you're cool with everybody you know, and then you violate the tenets of just the uh, you one violate one of the central know. properties. Mm -hmm. Well, no, or you're just like, hey, this is trash. And people are like, sure, screw you. You, how dare you uh, criticize a thing? Yeah. Bah, bah. You know, and in fact, Andrew told me the, the, the wisest thing about that is that some people with certain things that, especially people that came from an era where like nerd stuff wasn't catered to, now it's all culture. Yeah. But it's like, nerds is cool now. They're afraid. That if you if if they acknowledge or say something bad, it might go away. It go away, yeah. Because that because there was a point in time where it happened, and it's like, oh, okay. Well, people aren't all talking about how great Doctor Who is. Oops, I guess Doctor Who's gone forever. Never again will it will it raise its head. Same with Star Trek. And yeah. then it's like it's like all right. So now you you got to you got to be careful, or else you're gonna get ratioed and canceled like yeah. you did. <laughs> I know. You know, another thing too is is that like I, the, you get the strongest reactions. Like it's kind of like prequel syndrome when they know there's these flaws and they don't want to acknowledge the flaws mm -hmm. because if they think about the flaws, it will lose value. Yeah. And and that's where and I it's like ah yeah, yeah you're wrong. <laughs> and I totally recognize that, um, especially specifically for like sci-fi communities when it comes to media because sci-fi doesn't you know doesn't always get a good uh a good shake you know uh is it's not like it's a comedy or a drama right it's not like it's an easy all appealing thing you know sci-fi is uh, uh not easy to make for everybody and it makes it um you know a tougher sell uh when it's when it's more specific um yeah and so you kind of well, i, I we we live in we live in this it's going to be a perpetual golden age and and we're going to see we know that it works now we know that it's popular and now the problem is there's a lot of crappy product out there that's sort of in, and also showrunners who've taken over franchises have done horrible jobs that's part of my problem is that like yeah sometimes the franchise is great but the people put into it are just not suited for it and i think that's that's the biggest problem right now is that is that in sometimes studios will still decide like stargate brought brought up like stargate is one of the most successful from a from an episodic count point of view like stargate was incredibly successful like mm -hmm. one of each you know and then it went through we talked about the whole art is stargate online because the rights they tried this some silly sort of you know 
bargain basement approach to it's trying to make more content for it. But you know, that's a, that'll ha- we'll see more again. It'd be surprised yeah. the hell I out think, of me if we never because I think this past weekend they they announced they were making a new thing for Stargate. For Stargate, oh, cool. yeah. Let me see. Yeah, it uh, doesn't surprise me because it's it's one of those properties that like it never got sort of mainstream attention, but like. Yeah, new Stargate series oh, set cool. within SG-1 progressing. is progressing. So development, yeah, development, you know, that, that means a lot of things. But Yeah, uh, but but on the other hand, I mean, the advantage of that can be that uh, it can, because sometimes it's just, sometimes it's like you have to sort of make sure they got the rights back and the intentions there to do it. Let's yeah. see. Um, um, but so I, I, I get it. It's, it's a touchy subject, right? Um. A lot of a lot of crappy sci-fi out there too, right? You know, the yeah. cheap out and ends up being a lot like um I don't know. Um, I was about to talk about a movie I saw over the weekend, but that's not a sci-fi movie, but it's also a cheap, junky movie. Um, like a yeah, uh, no, this yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, just reading the article about Stargate. Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, oh. that's 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 ex- that's great. That would be great. That would be great. It's like like Star- Stargate thing. Um, all right, so we got about 45 minutes here to do some after things. Um, mm-hmm. uh, cool. Everybody good? Everybody got their break in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a comment. Somebody says, I like Stargate and Farscape more than Trek or Star Wars. So part of the thing is, if you're a certain age, that show was made for you. You know, the irreverence in Stargate, and both those shows had an irreverence and humor to them. Those other franchises didn't. And you know, there is, there's something to be said about something of like, you know, something, you know, of self-aware at a certain point. I am surprised going through these IMDB reviews of one star ratings that it took me quite a lot of scrolling to see the term SJW. So, um, it <laughs> seems like they're figuring out it's a this new, is, this is on which one, uh, on lower decks. Oh, <laughs> um, I also it, think, I also think that there's a, an undercurrent here of not liking Alex Kurtzman, who is an EP on the new, wave of star trek stuff, oh I believe. yeah so i, think I would a function of that too there might be um i think that of all of the new star trek properties like literally i mean the lower decks is the first thing i've liked really liked since generation yep i'm with you on that one it oh. it, it, it is it, it, I, I, this is weird never uh, words i never thought i would say lower decks is the best thing since the movie star trek first contact <laughs> like uh yeah 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 first contact was fun that was a fun fun movie yeah wow yeah i didn't expect it to be because it was just a mess and everything else but that was actually just fun i remember in the theaters it was fun but yeah cool all right, all right. you guys are using after things ready yep all right then i'll count you in andrew in three two Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Uh, 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 Star Trek Lower Decks is the best thing since First Contact. There, it's on the record now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ratified. <laughs> uh, Justin Robert Young. Uh, good day to you, fine sirs. Bryce Castillo. Oh, uh, forsooth. Hello. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. Man, well, totally. We're a bit all over the map. Uh, well, that was a, a great back... first draft. <laughs> we'll do better tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> good job. And I, I, and I still say it gets acknowledged as being good, but doesn't get as much love though. Undiscovered Country is a damn fine movie. It's 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 a fine murder she wrote that, and it's got yeah. David Warner in it, and that makes me happy. Oh, <laughs> oh okay, Warner. It, it's the as the eloquent Klingon. And remember the. Uh, the original Klingon version of Shakespeare, like yeah. like the you know the, the idea that Shakespeare was supposed to be a Klingon and ah, oh, <laughs> and it's like that that great the, the you know Spock says to Kirk you know we on Vulcan have a saying only Nixon can go to China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good, and it's so grounded. It's so grounded. It's just it's like the movies were the best when the stakes were more limited. You they know, kept, I mean, they like, kept it simple. Its play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, Wrath of Khan just being a sub uh, submarine battle movie, you know. Yeah, Horatio Hornblower, yeah, exactly. Star just, Trek Four, uh, just go home. That's all you have to do. Yeah, like you know? fish out of water, putting fish out of water. You know, they're like literally, but also the like 
uh, yeah, no, how are we going to fit in there? Double dumbass on you. <laughs> 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 oh, it's just, it is so good. Uh, anyhow, um, hey, so uh, some news leaked today. And that is there'd been rumors that Oculus was going to come out with the Oculus Quest 2. Um, and uh, they some videos came out of people demonstrating the Oculus Quest 2. And Oculus said, yep, it's happening. So I think tomorrow or the next couple of days, because they're going to have the Quest Connect, they're going to officially unveil the Quest 2, which is uh, they say that it's lighter. We don't know by how much. It's actually got the new Snapdragon processor. Um, it's got a uh, 50% more resolution to it and, uh, it's supposed to be more comfortable, et cetera, which they've also pushing the whole thing of the link, the idea of the cable that you use that to connect to your PC. So a very big, interesting play. I want to kind of hear your guys' take on this. Does this make you more interested or I, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm a little bit spoiled in that, you know, I've been playing with the Vive for so long and I've gotten accustomed to have, having a tail of uh, a tether behind me at all times. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope that it is graphically comparable to what I've been used to. If it is and there's no tether and you could just, you know, full on just walk around out in public with it and, and it just remaps everything and people come up with cool stuff, then... Uh, that would be very, very exciting to me. Uh, uh, but out, outside of that, it's it's um, playing. Uh, it's it, it seems like a very cozy, uh, still playing catch up to the Vive. Well, uh, I guess I, that it's it, it different between like a, you know, in some ways, it's the argument like the difference between a handhold and a console. Right. You know, the console you got to go sit there, handhold you pick up, and it's ready. Or PC because like you put this that you press a button and this thing's on. Yeah. You know. Um, Justin, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, yeah, no, basically what you said. I mean, I think that there there are things that uh, if you only look at it graphically, uh, then it's it's you know gonna miss uh, what what seems like the point of uh, why this is special, and that is you are going to get less of the kind of graphic immersion, but more of the actual immersion that might matter more, that might make it feel more real, and and to unlock elements of uh, gameplay that otherwise doesn't uh, exist, even with the Vive. Like, the Vive is something that you can get graphical immersion, but also it's like, you know, even then, the, like, screen door on on the Vive, which is better than what um, VR was in the past, I, I don't doubt that now we can probably do better, and this probably has, if it's not, if the graphics aren't there, it might be a little bit more clear, and also the idea that you don't have the setup and you don't have the light boxes and you don't have the things possibly not working. There's, you know, I, I I've spent the last week and I almost bought it and I held off um, because I wanted to get raised the dead done and out the door before I treated myself to a thing. But like, I was thinking a lot about Andrew's pick of the Oasis, the Kindle Oasis and, and simply the idea of like, would I read more? if I took away just the frustration I have with the, the swiping of the Kindle that I have, like that it doesn't work enough times or I have to think about it enough times that it degrades my ability to hold focus. If I, if, if this were just a physical thing that I always had my finger on and I always knew how to help, I always knew how to hold it or how I wanted to hold it. Like, would that be different? And I think that's the same thing with this. Uh, oftentimes, it is the smallest things that you don't even realize are taking you out of something that you don't even realize uh, you uh, that that they matter. The absence of these obstacles, these small obstacles, matter. And as much as you know, Brian, you're like, yeah, look, the vibe is great. I'm used to. I've got my technique down to like make sure that I don't accidentally hog tie myself and fall face down on the floor. Uh, but what if you were able to free up those cycles and then you were focusing on the game all that much more? And we don't know. Uh, you don't know that until you until you start using it. So yeah, I forgot you still this, the the vice still has the lighthouse too. Like that's thing I, I keep forgetting because like that's the fun thing about the quest is literally it's like oh I'll do it. I'll just take it in the living room and I'm you're you're in plane or I take it on a trip. You know. Um, yeah. And you you know I have friends that sometimes we'll get together and we'll bring our quest together and that's kind of the cool thing is you can just sort of. 
uh, the mobility of it. But you're you're always the PC driven performance is always going to be better if you can plug a cable into it and cook it up to a powerful PC. It is always going to be better, and and so you're never going to have a mobile experience that's going to get better than you know your gaming PC driving a much faster refresh rate and all that. And and I think that that's there's going to be people that it's like that will be the deciding factor. It's going to be like it might be like Brian. It might be like like no, if I can't have you know I want to have 120 you know refresh rate and I want to have you know full eight 4K eventually or whatever. Like right. that will always and, be the and, leading and, experience. And, uh, you know, 4X uh, anti aliasing and uh, you know mm -hmm. all the shadows and the, the the ray tracing and all that stuff. Um, I I'll, I'll be really curious whether or not uh, uh, the this new uh, uh, quest would be able to run Half-Life Alex because that, that sort of is like a, a powerful bellwether moment in VR gaming. You you can do Alex on their quest right now with the cable. It's just not a great experience. Right. And so I imagine with this, because what's interesting too is the original quest, the Snapdragon processor they put in there was already like two years old. And they did that because of just the power consumption and everything else like this. The Quest is an amazingly well-optimized device. Like you get into it and you realize that it's got the inside out tracking and the fact that you don't need any external things to do your motion. The motion tracking, everything for me performs perfectly. And I am super, super prone to nausea. Like I get sick on rides that people tell you like, oh, the person we have to test this who gets sick doesn't get sick on it. I get sick on it. This has been great. And so uh that's been they used it the older pro now this is the latest snapdragon processor in it so i would imagine with the tether i imagine you'd probably be able to do a pretty good you know a pretty good you know experience playing alex yeah like so it, it. I, um it, not 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 to grandstand too much on this but uh uh man i, I is there any tickle on the morality side of things of the fact that you know facebook like like for whatever reason that that seems to be a beef with me and and uh, it's uh, not rational and i know i know google's selling my information i know no, i know I, I know i just just i uh, can't stop i no i would, I would that part i think you you and i both have grudges because you and i both went through experiences where we we built audiences on Facebook only to have Facebook change the rules in an unapologetic sort of way. Multiple and it becomes times. Sort of yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then to me, I'm like done, like I'm done. Like I will pop into Instagram to say hello to people just so they know I'm alive. I don't go on Facebook. I don't do that. I will, when there is the Android to the Facebook iPhone quest, when there is an alternate to it, pull me on board. Cause here's the beautiful thing. All these great games that you love, you know, people love on quest and I don't, Facebook is aware of this, I'm sure, but like the really great games, they're all developed in Unreal. They're all developed in Unity. They're all easily, you can port them over to other systems and most of them come from other systems to begin yeah. with. So the, they're trying to like the lock-in might be the titles you buy for it, but you know, we, we, we just, we moved to where we want to be. Now Facebook is pushing, we talked about Horizons. Did we do an update on that? I don't know if we did. So Horizons is Facebook's environment for uh it's there's rec room which you've seen before rec room you can go in there and create different experiences and stuff facebook is launching horizons which is their own version of this where you can go in and create new multiplayer games with friends and create sort of stuff and they have some new yeah Br uh, bryce has got a, a video there's oh, actually oh, newer I, I, stuff I think we did i think yeah. we did yeah. talk about this yeah yeah yeah, this is yeah. Like there's there's a, a version of rec room right like yeah and if you yeah yeah bryce there's new stuff from this year that they show they've now have the bait and people been playing it so it's a very interesting experience and like Facebook so far hasn't brought in outside developers to build experiences. They're looking for community stuff, which is curious, which implies to me that they're looking for like the Facebook horizon experience. But yeah, I, I'll buy the other version of the quest, you know, the, the alt version when it exists, um, but it don't exist yet, but it yeah. will, but not right now. Um, so I hear you. I fully hear you. I, I and, but I'm excited to see that the quest is moving forward. I'm excited to see that the the thing in doing the uh, the faster hardware on it, it does imply that the quest, the original quest, there's going to be games that will no longer work on it because it clearly. 
I had this conversation a week ago with a friend, like we're talking about, oh, what would you want to see in a Quest 2? And I'm like, I said, I'd rather see them put the fastest hardware because that means the game quality is going to increase tremendously, even if it means telling people on the older Quest, I'm sorry, this game won't play on yours. Yeah, and I think that that's, it really depends on on what kind of model they want to follow. If, if it's a hardware or console model, then yeah, like that's, people are used to it. There's a reason why you buy the new thing because it runs the new games and the old thing doesn't run the new games. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's curious. And, you know, this wondering too, like, uh, Oculus, cause they do between the rift, which is, you know, the one, the wired one. And then where they're doing the quest is we haven't heard like, what's going to, because like this, this, the new quest two, looks like it'll have pretty much the same specs as the Rift, and it's why buy a Rift when you can buy a Quest and plug it into your computer, and then ha implies that we may see a big bump in what the PC-powered one is going to do. There's been talk. They've been, we talked about this before. They've been working on, I think we mentioned something in the show, the adaptive optics. So, like, when you're depth of field, you put, like, objects in close to you. Like, you see the focal point changes and shifts. And, you know, this... The Quest 2 is supposed to have like the, you know, oh, quote, 4K, which means like two 2K displays, which it's not really 4K, but nonetheless, much higher resolution. We may go, you know, much higher there. So the PC experience is going to be interesting. Yeah. I yes. mean, look, I, I, I think that there's, there's a, a, a mobility is the key. And, yeah. and if you are uh, developing for it, I think taking advantage of that is fine. And for people that have, played uh you know the experience that, that brian and i have uh you know with with dedicated hardware for it for a, a significant period of time then uh i think there still is a lot of room for this and and i mean i know andrew you've been effusive about it and you have been the guiding light on on all vr stuff so i i do uh i do look forward to being at a point where i want to treat myself into getting it <laughs> so let me ask ask a question in, in a broader sense have any of you guys ever done any web based any vr stuff in your in your rift i mean in your vive have you ever done any browser based vr uh o only to like uh you know when i i'm trying to buy a game in vr and i i have to go through their clunky like uh, open up paypal and uh or you know, i'll sign in for it I'll, I'll occasionally uh, hit a button and, you know, to get your virtual desktop just to be like, I just mm -hmm. need this thing to get open to the whatever. So, in a, so it's, a, it's very interesting because like web VR, the ability to deliver VR experiences through the web in your, in your uh, headset is pretty sophisticated. You know, I've built, you know, I've built entire, you know, experiences. Like I built my, you know, like a version of my shark trainer, the thing I practiced to be around great white sharks. I built it in using what was called WebVR. It's now WebXR on a framework called A-Frame. I built that in there. And you go to a website in your headset, you go to ghostdiver.xyz and you play the experience. And now you can all of a sudden play this thing in VR. And it's not going to be as fast as like it's something that's running on Unity, you know, whatever, a game engine, whatever. But it can be pretty cool experiences. There's Moon Rider, which is the web version of Beat Saber, which is pretty damn good you know comparatively compared to something that's just using all web technologies and that's sort of an exciting sort of thing is that i wish there was more attention towards the web vr stuff because if we're looking for creating experiences outside of the facebook ecosystem that's kind of the direction we need to think about going um that's that's to, interesting because when i think about that kind of application for it uh i that's the kind of thing that i would never you know step into the vive area and strap on and put on the gauntlets and the headsets and everything but if 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 there was an experience that that was better for a quest would be perfect for you know that that sort of uh you know light portable experience of just like ah let me jump in real quick okay now i'm out well i guess what i'm saying is though that you could create rich experiences using vr as, as web, using the web as the delivery for it. you could be creating like interact you you there are interact there's a lot of versions of stuff that's in your v, that you have on vive there's actually web-based versions of some of that stuff you know and that's the thing i'm saying is that like you could be creating games and experiences like you can do multiplayer like paintball shooters and stuff using 
the web VR version. And once you're in it, it feels like the one, like the thing you downloaded on your thing. Maybe, you know, there's going to be some performance issues there, but that's the thing that's fascinating to me is that that's really where we want the future to kind of go is sort of using the web as the delivery thing. So that way we're not beholden to one garden kind of thing. I wonder, uh, yeah. speaking of, of walled gardens, I wonder, I wonder how far off we are from, uh, Apple's new killer feature being uh, uh, automatically recording some version of 360 video with everything so that uh, especially when like, you know, big news items happen uh, and they, they get released or live streamed or whatever, it's very like you don't even know that you're doing a 360 thing. You're just using your phone like you always do. And then likewise, it's easy to hop in just by grabbing your quest and and being there and maybe maybe there's a fidelity issue with the stitching on the two sides or oh so you mean in terms of like calling like a like a facetime call that would go to vr or no no, no like a, let's say let's say the president is talking and or 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 you know any of these you know uh, maybe police incidents are happening or whatever you know all of a sudden we're all trained to go out you know pull our phones out and start recording um i i wonder um if if both cameras, you know, might not be a, f a feature where it's like it grabs both sides, does some amount of stitching on the fringes, and then anybody can not just not just watch the video of this this you know, uh, yeah. know terrorist attack or whatever terrible news thing is happening, but instead is able to just pop on and then get something close enough to being there. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if that's if that's a thing, but I, I, uh, I do think that you are, are very prescient in that I could absolutely see as like a version of enhanced live photos, because that's what, you know, Apple just decided like, all right, well now every live photo, every photo that you have, we're going to give you like the second on a little side bit on it. each side of it. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and uh, I, if, if, hold on, hold on, hold oh, on. Sure. If, sure. If instead, or if, as in, in addition to you did get both sides of the camera and like the ad is the baby takes its first steps. And not only are you getting that forever, but you're also getting your reaction to what is happening. I could, I could totally see that. And, and there yeah, are the devices that, that already do that, but they're separate standalone devices. And of course, no, no, you know, no, the idea yeah, would, be, would be, this take would something be that you already do thing. and yeah. transform it. Yeah. Yeah, you. I mean, as pointed out here, you would need to have new lenses on there because the angles at best on these things don't even approach to be able to give you a 360. Um, so that would be, you would need to be putting basically a fisheye in the front on the back, which given now how many cameras that new phones have, who's to say that that doesn't become crazy, but well, it and also then, does on, mean that on you're- On top of that, there's, uh, I, you know, we've talked about, you know, AI getting so good at filling in the gaps on things that, you know, we're, mm -hmm. I, I could see it's like, you know, there's a front focus and a rear focus and yeah, we're kind of, it's pretty much this in between. Yeah, I mean, you can do that, like, you know, OpenAI just showed a paper where they showed like the ability to sort of, finish and imagine but the problem is there is if you're holding a thing and you're capturing a live event and it's making up 40 percent of that data that's problematic uh, we are better off just saying here's our front and here's our back and there are uh, there are things that let you record both cameras at the same time and like i don't know if you've seen there's a really cool uh uh app now that if you want to shoot with your iphone while you're recording you can switch from the different cameras on the front or the back at the same time choose the close-up choose the wide shot <laughs> which makes for sort of a really cool, like you, your one phone all of a sudden looks like a three camera shoot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a couple different versions of this out there now. But the other thing too, like I think that were the the leaked footage, the leaked photos apparently show the next iPhone will have not surprisingly the lidar, which is going to be great because yeah. that's going to give you all that depth information from the scene and. It's not going to be 360, but for Brian, from the point of view of VR stuff, is you'd be able to put your phone there and capture a 360 environment, put on your headset and step into the photo. Yeah, I guess maybe like, that, that 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 would be a middle step of what I'm imagining, absent of, like you said, a fisheye on both sides. You, you could probably say like, uh, hey, if you want to do 360, all you got to do is kind of hose everything down. 
uh, and then once it's hosed down, it says, congrats, uh, stay where you are, record whatever you want. And then, and then uh, at that point, it would have accurate fill-in information for anything off, uh, off yeah, camera. Yeah, I would, I guess I'm personally more excited about the idea of it doing genuine 3D capture because we've seen examples of people using this to like, they film their couch and now the couch is a 3D object. Yeah. You know, you aim it at your friend, now your friend's a 3D object. And that's kind of, that to me, is because, and you can also use it where you can scan a whole environment, but just the idea of real-time 3D capture is insane. That's wild. To me, because, yeah. Yeah, I had, because like, yeah, I had a couple of those like add-ons. I've got like multiple 360 degree cameras. And to be honest with you, like, you end up sort of choosing one point of view to look at because actually watching stuff in 360 sucks. Because you're always trying to like, oh, where should I go? Should I turn here? Should I turn there? And it's like, you know, make a choice. Uh, yeah, and in to that, I, I suspect that there'll be another generation of AI that figures that out for you. Where it's just like, uh, hey, no, we've we've watched enough other people watch this to know you need to see this, you need to glance over, see this coming, and then watch, go back to this in order to get this moment or whatever. Well, sure. I guess I'd say some of the examples you brought up, though, like in like some of the civil disobedience stuff and all that, like sometimes people really only want you to see one, the camera pointing in one direction. I, I mean, I mean, I, so think, I, I think that might be like like an important thing, you know, because, because you're right. Uh, if people are... When they're pointing the camera, they're they're directing the focus and the attention. Well, I'm, I'm saying they're going to control what you're. I'm saying the fact that this would default to this doesn't mean that they're going to go. Okay, I guess we'll show the side now. I just think it's like I think that's a that would not be a feature they would would we would would be used because of that. Uh oh, that's interesting. It would um, also feel like a compromise to like the trustworthiness of any of this footage if any amount of it is like AI composited, right? If like, oh, yes, I mean, we see these two cameras, but then the AI said that, you know, there, this guy was over here on the side, and then he pops up over here. Like, like sure, sure, that's, sure, that's, sure. Well, that's and, literally fa fabricated footage at that sure. point. Sure, and, and, and also also not what I'm excited about, uh, but, but would, would imagine would be a middle step to, to get to. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that it would be great. I mean, I think it would be neat if we got in the habit of let's capture the whole scene because, and we've in you know, the unedited scene too, because we've seen examples and conflicts both sides from a policing point of view and then from the point of view of people who are suspects of stuff, where you look at from a different point of view, a different camera view, and all of a sudden changes the context. And we've seen examples on both sides of that. And whoever controls the camera in that point can, in many ways, sort of control the narrative, uh, and that's. You know, the 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 more objective that is, the better. But that's also, you know, we have like I have no problem with using facial recognition algorithms in public. I have no problem with it because I've seen, I know it's beneficial law enforcement and stuff to identify suspects and stuff. But it's a controversial issue because we say, should these things be used, you know, against us or whatever? And and that's just we step into that whole debate with this of like, uh, we love a thing when it serves us, and then we don't. We saw a police body cams, and then when body cam footage was using to actually get more convictions in some cases of people who were pro body cam became not so pro body cam. Uh, uh yeah, no, that's that's some complicated, that's some crazy yeah. trash. Yeah, so just a podcaster. Um, uh, you guys got picks? <laughs> Uh, I'm still watching The Vow. We mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm not giving up on it just yet. Um, I might cross the line of, of actually reading up on the story so that I can know, because as uh, it sounded like Justin's complaint is that uh, at this point, they're, they're, they're overly shaping the narrative, um, uh, but, and I know uh, yeah, nothing about it. Yeah, well, no, my pick is the vow too, and I don't know as much about Nixium as as others. I really only know that it was this weird. I mean, I know basically what we know now in the documentary. That's pretty much like the the uh, extent of my knowledge is that it was this Svengali like guy who ran this you know organization. They made a bunch of money. They had some very very rich benefactors, and 
there was this weird uh, master slave sexual situation. My issue with the documentary is that I'm okay with it. I think, especially now in a very mature, uh, a mature genre of documentary series, documentary filmmaking, I can understand that we want to get into a world where maybe there are some theatrical conceits here where we're recreating certain things, where we are shaping a narrative so it is at its most exciting. I think that, that the era of where we, where, where we are can kind of uh, allow for that. Where I do think it crosses the line, especially with subject matter as serious as this, is when we, I don't know where we are in time. I suspect that a lot of this stuff is recreated. And then it's put up, it's put right next to stuff that is like actually artfully recreated. It, it, it's, it's a person for whom doesn't want to appear on camera. So it's an actress and, and other actresses reenacting her live and uh, her, her story. And it's like, okay, well, now, A, we're focusing on people in this very reality television kind of way that takes me out of why I was excited about this very vital story as it was being told before. And number two, I also kind of don't think that they're focusing on some of the more interesting elements of it. And then that gets into the kind of suspicious element of like, well, why are you doing all of this? <laughs> but but the, the first two, I think, are just the artistic problems that I that I had specifically with the fourth episode. Yeah, I my incursion to people is by all all means watch it, but then go don't let it be your only source of it because my frustration with it is that there are people who are principally involved in telling the story in the documentary that there's not a lot of attention put on where what they were saying, what they were doing when they were involved in it in years before because the alec you you watch this documentary and you'd be kind of thinking that everything sort of just broke open in like 2017 or something like this when the criticisms against nexium had started a decade before you know there had been there had been a number of claims and stuff against them for years and people leaving saying they've got problems and stuff and if you watch this you wouldn't necessarily know that you would kind of, and you, cause that's the question I'd like to hear. I want to hear the people who are kind of that's taking the point of view of, I want to hear them kind of explain like, what were you doing when this was said? What were you doing when people were coming forward? And you know, why did you decide to sell your organization when you thought they were doing criminal things and stuff? And, and there might be really good answers to that. And, you know, I know it in documentary, you have to sort of choose a narrative, but my frustration is that, uh, there there is it's very beneficial to be friends with the people making the documentary <laughs> you know uh because... I, I i just think it's like look uh, we we've, we've all watched and read stuff about like let's say scientology where you have people that come out of it that part of their story is i was doing bad i knew i was doing bad i watched bad things happen and eventually the hold that the organization had over me be it psychological or financial was not something that could hold me anymore and I left. And I I do think that there are parts of this documentary because of who they focus on and because of who is bringing a lot of the original shot from within Nixium footage that does make this very visually compelling that two of the main people are like, what? This is a crazy cult? I am shocked, shocked that this is happening. Oh my God. I had, as soon as I found out about this, I was out the door. Like my butt was on fire where it's like, it, it doesn't feel quite like those other stories of like, no, I remember the first time that I heard and I put it in the back of my mind or I was able to demonize the people that were saying it because I believed in this so much where like there's, there's not a lot of that which is, is I think, part of some of these stories that does feel missing. So, like, there was, in 2009, a number of people fled Nexium, calling it a court, I mean, calling it a cult, all of this. That was a public sort of thing. And they, the people involved here, we haven't heard them comment about that. Like, what, what did, you know, what did they, 
what do they say? You know, Vanity Fair did an article in 2010 calling it a cult and talking about all these some crazy stuff on this. And it was just this like in this version of the story, none of that happened. You know, this version of the story, it's like, oh, we realized in 2017 something weird was going on. And I'm like, that's crazy like you know rainier was alleged to have like been keeping like an ex-girlfriend locked up in a house like in a room for like a year you know past this point and rumors of this stuff that's that's the frustrating thing for me is that it's just this i don't know why they don't go into that why why do they start the story there and pretend that everything was a secret until then when it was a wide open hey this is probably a cult there are a lot of people saying it's a cult you know yeah so uh, I have a tentative pick. Uh, I watched this uh, the other night. I watched this last night, and um, I'm I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the listeners um, uh, some advice for this. Uh, this is the Netflix uh, film from Charlie Kaufman. I'm thinking of ending things. Uh, oh, go, did you go, like it? Go into this thinking that this is a th- thriller. Have the word thriller in your head when you watch this, because I watched the trailer. The trailer's really cool and. The things that the trailer hint at are not what this film is. And I was very confused. Um, There are a lot of things I don't like about this film. It is too long. There is a sequence near the end of the film that is laughably, that is a laughable idea. You would, if you were writing a a comedy script about a a, a fancy art film that's just a little too, a little too hoity-toity, there's an entire sequence that that is unironically uh, done. Um, uh, It's, it's weird. It's not a puzzle box um, and it's not, um, I don't know, some, it's not a puzzle box is what I'll say. I'm thinking of ending things is a thriller. And it wasn't until after I read that on Wikipedia that I was like, Oh, I probably should have had that expectation going in because. So less, less like, you know, being John Malkovich, which is, is a magical premise that is more about the human consequences of it than like a race against time. Uh, y- yes. Um, there, I, I wouldn't even call it horror, but it is, I, I think you're supposed to see this in a in a sort of thriller, uh, sort of kind of on the edge of your seat vibe, which is tough for a two and a quarter hour film. Um, uh, but it, I, I do think it's interesting. I think the premise of it is interesting. After I tweeted about it last night, everyone was saying, well, you should, you should read the book. The book is a little more specific on what is happening and what has happened. Um, but I think it's 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 really interesting. Uh, the editing is really fascinating because it's a lot of, overlapping on top of each other right a lot of like cutting people off and a lot of like and so it just feels like really rushed in some ways and and in a socially awkward way the way that if if you when you cut when you you cut someone off from speaking you're like oh oh okay um there's kind of a lot of that tony collette uh is in here as the mother she's great uh jesse plemons and jesse buckley do um really good jobs as as the protagonists or the main characters i guess um it's interesting. I'll say it's interesting. Um, I'm thinking of ending things on Netflix. Cool. I have a, a documentary pick and on the subject of things that do weird reenactments, this man, this does uh, uh, the bit player. It's about Claude Shannon, who is the information theorist who basically came up with the concept of like using zeros and ones for binary and a very fascinating guy who kind of ahead of his time. And they do this thing in the documentary where, because he's since passed away a while ago, they stage uh, interviews with, they have an actor playing him, and then they basically faux interview this actor playing him like in the 1980s. And so it's a weird, weird conceit because like you're watching them answering stuff and then they have a woman playing his wife in the background, like cleaning up like during the interview and stuff. And then she gets, it's such a, I, but he's such an interesting guy. I'm like, check it out. But OMG, is it weird to watch a documentary, literally fake documentary interviews with a guy to have him talk about this point of view? Like maybe it sounded clever or whatever. And I'm like, it puts it, it puts a layer of falseness there, which kind of frustrates me because I'm watching a guy pretend to be, that's not him. You know, it's, that's a guy pretending to be him, you know? 
Yeah, so. you know, I, I I think that again, we're in a very mature era for uh for this kind of product, and I think people are taking different chances. Uh, some work better than others, <laughs> and and yeah. I think the ones that work the best are the ones where I'm heightened into the story as opposed to I'm now questioning the authenticity of the information. And I think that's sometimes where the art can kind of subsume the message is when to make things more palatable, you're making me question whether or not I should believe this. Yeah. He, and I didn't realize that Mark Levinson made this, he made particle fever, which I actually had some friends that were producers on that, um, worked on that, which I think was a great, you know, talk about that, but yeah, I was just again. The topic is great. I'm thrilled that he, they made a documentary about him. But I'm like, I'm like, this is like, this is really weird. I'm like, oh, this is really weird. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Other than that, check it out though. Uh, gentlemen, it's been after. Hey, there we go, everybody. Yeah, they did that same thing on the uh, that National Lamp Lampoon documentary with oh, that was well that wasn't no that was a movie right well, yeah, that was yeah, that yeah. was a fictional movie yeah 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 when martin mole is telling you he's some other person you know like you're yeah like, yeah you know what's up yeah yeah and i was and I, I was confused too which i love and that was it was perfect for that but here it was just like ah oh, we don't have any archive we don't have any interview footage of oh, we'll have an actor play him and interview him and it's a weird 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 choice yeah uh, well, you know what's not a weird choice is uh, sticking around. Uh, we're going to have happy hour in about a half hour. Is that right, Phil? Yeah, 30 minutes. Oh, we'll see you yeah, then. Yeah, baby. Uh, 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 Court Killers at 6 p.m. We got Shannon Morse on tonight. That'll be fun. Uh, Sweet. Follow Justin R. Young. Follow Andrew Main on Twitter for Periscopes and stuff. And uh, until then, see you guys later. Bye. Later. Bye.